Welcome to the next segment of the American Jewish Committee Virtual Global Forum, a debate on the critical international affairs issues at stake in this year's US presidential election. I'm Jason Isaacson, AJC's Chief Policy and Political Affairs Officer, and I'm pleased to welcome back to AJC two distinguished representatives of the major party presidential candidates. K.T. McFarland, who was Deputy National Security Advisor early in President Trump's term and served in previous Republican administrations, and Antony Blinken, Senior Foreign Policy Advisor to Vice President Biden and a former Deputy Secretary of State and Deputy National Security Advisor under President Obama. Neither of our debaters is a stranger to AJC. K.T. McFarland was a featured speaker in an AJC Republican National Convention program in St. Paul, Minnesota in 2008. Tony Blinken addressed our global forum in person, not virtually, in Washington in 2015. It's good to see both of you again. Pleasure. Uh, even more than any of us might have imagined just a few months ago, 2020 is turning out to be a year of big challenges and big decisions for the United States and the world. And among the biggest decisions is the question of who is going to lead America and the free world beginning next January. For our AJC virtual forum, virtual global forum audience, we're planning to spend the next hour or so debating the critical foreign policy issues that now confront America and our allies, and that specifically concern the Jewish community, issues that will be or should be on the minds of American voters as November approaches. Now first, a word on our debating format. I'm going to ask each of you to offer an opening statement of no more than two minutes after which you will each have two minutes for rebuttal. We will then engage in several rounds of questioning, which I will expect uh, to generate rebuttals. Finally, you will have an opportunity to make concluding remarks. I anticipate a spirited debate, and I would just ask that you keep your remarks on topic and that you remain civil. <laughs> it's my job to keep time and to serve as referee. Let's begin with opening statements. KT, you first. Um, I'd like to start by saying that although President Trump himself doesn't do a very good job, frankly, of explaining what his overall policy is, I'd like to talk about what drives his positions on America first, make America great again, peace through strength. And to me, and, and I think to President Trump in the conversations I've had with him, it's an understanding that the post-war world has really changed. That in the, at the, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, our European allies and our European and Asian adversaries were so destroyed and the American economy was so strong that what we did was we underwrote and subsidized the security agreements that we had with our allies and the economic arrangements, the trade agreements that we had with them. And we did it at our expense and we did it with a very deliberate purpose, which is if those nations became strong, um, could stand on their own two feet, they would become allies and, and trading partners. And that has worked brilliantly. They no longer need our help in the same way that they did. And what we did then, in the period after that with China was that we thought, well, the Chinese would be the same. We would extend those kind of opportunities to the Chinese, but it turned out not to be the same. And so when President Trump took the Oval, uh, took his oath of office, his intention was to rearrange the relationship with our allies, our trading partners and security allies, to recalibrate, not to give up those relationships, but to recalibrate them, renegotiate them, and then to the Chinese to stand up to the Chinese for what he saw was systematic abuse of the last 20 years. So America first means putting America's interests first, not other countries, but America's interests first. Make America great again. That means fixing the American economy, understanding that without a strong economy, we're not, we have no leverage to negotiate with these countries. You know, it's just begging. It's not really negotiating. And then finally, peace through strength, rebuild the American military, but get away from and get out of and don't get back into uh, what he saw as fruitless, pointless, unwinnable wars in the Middle East. Thank you, KT. Tony, your opening statement. Well, Jason, thank you. And thank you first and foremost to the American Jewish Committee for bringing us together. For over a century, uh, the AJC has raised its voice in defense of those who cannot, fighting oppression with unflinching advocacy, intolerance with unwavering commitment. And I've got to say that that voice is more vital uh, than ever. So thank you for doing this. Look, the next president's going to inherit a divided country and a world in disarray. The best answer to those challenges is democracy. It's the foundation of our strength at home and abroad. It reflects who we are, how we see ourselves, and maybe most important, how the world sees us. And that democracy is being challenged as never before. That matters 
as never before. Uh, the strength of our democracy at home is directly tied to our ability to be a force for progress in the world and to mobilize collective action. Unfortunately, President Trump's daily assault on our own democracy, its institutions, its values, its people, has deeply tarnished our ability to lead. Unleashing the US military against American citizens, peacefully protesting for racial justice for the sake of a photo op is only the most recent example. And abroad, other democracies are a source of strength for America, especially when we act together. But we all know this, democracies have been in retreat. Uh, of the 41 or so countries ranked fully free by Freedom House through the 1980s, the 1990s, the 2000s, fully half have fallen backwards. There's a democratic recession and autocracies from Russia to China seek to exploit and add fuel to our troubles. Yet at the very moment democracies are looking to the United States to be the leader of the free world, President Trump, by embracing autocrats and dismissing Democrats, and as the leading consumer and proliferator of conspiracy theories, seems to have suited up for the other side. Joe Biden will renew our democracy at home. He'll revitalize our alliances with democracies around the world. He will bring us together as Americans and as a community of democracies. With Joe Biden as president, America will once again lead not just by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. Tony, thank you. Let me offer uh, opportunities for rebuttal to both of you. Uh, KT, you first. You know, one thing that strikes me um, about what I'll call the sort of traditional approach to foreign policy, which I was an advocate of for decades, um, and I no longer am. And that's because I think words and deeds seem to have gotten separated in the United States and really in the world. Now, those were beautiful words that Tony has, and, and I would subscribe to most of, almost all of them. In fact, most of them, all of them. But I think that deeds didn't match the words. And that's why I look at somebody like President Trump. And is he brash? Is he, you know, does he sometimes tweet the wrong things in the middle of the night? Sure, he even knows that he does that. But look at what he's done. I mean, Tony mentioned that he called out the military um, on peaceful protesters. No, he didn't. He talked about it, but he didn't do it. And some of the things that he said and threatened and all, he doesn't do, look what he does, don't look necessarily at what he says, because for, for Donald Trump, remember, he's not a politician. He doesn't come to this with, you know, with means, he doesn't sort of poll test everything. He comes to it as a businessman, a New York businessman in the real estate world of New York, where the goal is, is how do you get, how do you win? How do you, how do you achieve your objective? Now, maybe to get there, you have to do things that, you know, you can make yourself look like an idiot. You might make other people look like an idiot, but at the same time, you want to win. You want to get there. And I think that if you look at what President Trump has done, he said that he was going to move the capital from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. He did it. He said he was going to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal. He did it. He said he was going to stand up to China. He did it. He told the NATO allies, you got to pay more or we're, we're going to you know, potentially walk away from this treaty. Guess what? The European allies, for the first time in decades, have ponied up to pay more. So again, I believe in beautiful words too, and I sure do believe in democracy. But this is an essential time when it's not just the words, it's the deeds. And I think we only have a few short years to stand up to our adversaries, particularly to China, to reassert American world leadership. Because if not, if China rules the 21st century, you can forget about all those pretty world, pretty, pretty words, because democracy won't survive. A democracy won't thrive. And American independence, American foreign policy independence, economic independence, that won't exist. Tony, uh, your response? Thank you. Well, look, KT's right. Uh, ultimately, deeds matter the most, but words have an impact, uh, a huge impact. And, they, and so, do, so do the deeds that we've seen from President Trump. Not one of the big challenges that we face going forward, whether it's climate change, mass migration, technological disruption, or pandemic disease, can be met by any one nation acting alone, even one as powerful as the United States. And there is no wall high enough or wide enough to contain these threats. Yet at the very time, we need to find new ways to cooperate and bring other countries along by nearly every measure the credibility and influence of the United States under President Trump is in freefall. According to the most recent Pew Global Survey, people have more confidence in Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping to do the right thing regarding world affairs than they do in President Trump. The American people know it. According to Gallup, 
And this was before the president's disastrous handling of the coronavirus and the killing of George Floyd. Two thirds of Americans recognized that President Trump is not respected by world leaders. As president, Joe Biden will have to pick up the pieces of the carnage that has been wrought under the Trump administration. He will have to salvage America's reputation, rebuild confidence in our leadership, mobilize our country and our allies to rapidly meet new challenges. I believe that by his experience, his knowledge, and his decency and character, no one is better prepared than Joe Biden to meet this moment. Thank you, Tony. Now, let's begin uh, a round of questions. Um, I'm going to pose a series of questions to each of you. You'll each have two minutes to respond and then two minutes to rebut. Uh, uh, and let me begin with a question that's on everyone's mind these last months. Uh, it's only logical to start with talking about the coronavirus pandemic and its economic fallout. Um, how America has responded, what role other nations have played in easing or exacerbating the spread of infection, and how these twin crises will affect our security and prosperity going forward. These issues will surely be on the minds of voters uh, come November. My question, what lessons does your candidate take away from this global public health emergency, and how will it shape his approach to interna international affairs after January 20th, 19, 20, 2021? Uh, KT, let me begin with you. Um, I think that when President Trump took the oath of office, he understood that he had a, a formidable um, competitor in the Chinese and negotiated to the point where he did get a, a pretty good, I think, phase one trade agreement with the idea that he get a phase two trade agreement. But then the pandemic came and that was a slap in the face. It was, it was more than a slap in the face. It was a real wake up call to everybody. And not only did the Chinese use, however the virus started, forget where, I don't even care where it started, but what the Chinese did when they knew they had a problem was that they used it as a bioweapon. They shut down travel within China. People couldn't go from Wuhan to the rest of China, but people could leave Wuhan to go to the rest of the world. And that's when the pandemic, when it, when it came, became a worldwide global pandemic. And then in addition to that, the Chinese have used their economic power um, and they used that period of time when the world didn't know, but the Chinese knew. They used that period of time to corner the market on medical devices and, and tests. And they went around then to the European countries and to the United States even, and they said, don't you dare criticize us. You criticize us and you're not going to get access to any of the masks or the testing equipment and, um, that we have and that we're going to let you have only if you say nice things about us. They came to the United States, to the president, and they said, we're going to cut off the supply of antibiotics. We're going to not let you have penicillin if you possibly criticize us. So they use it in a second way. They abuse their power in a second way. And then in a third way, what they've done now is they borrowed money from the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, and they're buying up properties, um, companies, tech companies, particularly resource companies, at fire sale prices. I think the Chinese always had a plan to by mid-century become the world's dominant power and to reorganize the world according to Chinese rules, they say with Chinese characteristics. I think the pandemic has speeded up their plan. So they now plan to emerge from this period as the world dominant power. What's President Trump gonna do about it? He's going to, first of all, bring the supply chains home so nobody can threaten us with pharmaceuticals or any other issues with our supply chain of critical technologies. Number two, he's going to build on a potential US-UK trade deal and all the other trade deals he's had to form a coalition of nations who are democracies, who are free traders, to stand up to the Chinese. And then number three, he's going to have a full-throated push for, tech, for us to maintain the technology commanding heights in technology and all the 10 areas of the future, and then to make sure that as we develop these things, we keep them safe and we don't let them get stolen, bought, transferred to countries which will use them against us. KT, thank you. Tony, uh, the Vice President Biden's response to the pandemic uh, going forward and the economic fallout of the pandemic. Well, let's talk about what we just experienced. President Obama and Vice President Biden saw pandemics as a growing threat. They put in place programs and people to try to prevent, detect, and deal with them, including in China. Um, a strong CDC presence, a dedicated White House office within the National Security Council, a program literally called PREDICT to detect the emergence of pandemics. President Trump, he dismantled or defunded virtually all of these efforts. Then when the virus struck and the Chinese government uh, withheld critical information and denied access to American and international experts, President Trump repeatedly for weeks on end praised their transparency and cooperation. 
Most recently, he's walked away from the World Health Organization in the midst of a pandemic, instead of working to reform it, ceding our leadership to China. As the deadliest public health crisis in generations spread across the world, the president ignored countless warnings from our own experts, including reportedly at least a dozen flashing red lights in the president's daily intelligence brief, something that KT and I are very familiar with. Instead of acting decisively to keep us safe, he echoed the Chinese government's propaganda and downplayed the threat. We should ask why. In my judgment, it was in part to ensure that China would not walk away from the empty trade agreement he negotiated to end the tariff war that was doing terrible damage to our farmers, our manufacturers, and our consumers. At the very time that President Trump failed to insist that China live up to its responsibilities, Joe Biden was publicly warning him not to trust the Chinese government and imploring him to fight to get our experts in. And frankly, there's nothing the president can say that will erase that history. Let me ask if each of you would uh, like to respond to what you've just heard. Uh, KT, first. Uh, deeds, not words. Um, Joe Biden was the one who just a few months ago said, hey, China, we're not, they're not going to eat our lunch. He said when President Trump imposed the travel ban and closed the border to China, he criticized President Trump for being a racist and a xenophobe. And, you know, I really think that one of the reasons that we're in the mess that we're in right now is because the O'Biden, uh, the O'Biden, the Obama <laughs> and Biden administrations, and even the George Bush administration before that, failed to stand up to China. They let them do what they have been doing, and now it's a wake-up call. So if I'm going to trust one guy who has the deeds to back up the words, I think it's Donald Trump. He closed the border. He's now taken steps, very serious steps in the last two or three weeks, to start bringing the supply chains home, to shut down a lot of the access that the Chinese have had to our technology. So in the future, I'm going to trust the guy who rebuilt the American economy once to rebuild the economy again a second time. Thank you, KT. Tony? <laughs> I've got to say, I think President Trump has been the best American president China has ever had. By virtually every key metric, China's strategic position is stronger and ours is weaker. President Trump has helped China achieve some of its key strategic goals. Weakening American alliances, check. Leaving a vacuum in the world for China to fill, check. Giving Beijing free reign to trample human rights and democracy in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, check. Decreasing our, debasing, excuse me, our own democracy and so reducing its appeal, checkmate. Uh, what about the trade deal? Uh, it proved to be a disaster. Uh, President Trump started a tariff war. It did terrible harm to our farmers, our manufacturers, our consumers. So basically he sued for peace before our election. The deal he signed does nothing to address the key structural issues that challenge our security and competitiveness. And China, of course, is nowhere near buying what it said it would buy. And President Trump inflicted real pain for almost no gain. What would Joe Biden do? He would invest in American workers and our competitiveness. He would rally allies and partners. He would stand up for democracy and human rights. He would deter aggression in the Asia Pacific. And he would work with China where we can, including on climate, on nonproliferation, and even on global health. When we engage China from a position of strength, we're much more likely to succeed. Tony, thank you. Now let's um, let's go to a question on alliances and uh, America's international position. Uh, this year marks the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, and across those tumultuous years, it is widely agreed that America has been the essential leader in international affairs, shaping institutions, shaping security compacts and arms control agreements that have kept us out of a third global conflagration. Is America destined to be the leader of the free world? forever, what will be uh, your, what will your candidate rather do to extend that 75 year run? How important is it to maintain a strong transatlantic partnership as a component of US leadership? And further in a post pandemic America with an overtaxed federal budget that we're likely to see, can we continue to afford global leadership? KT, again, let me begin with you. You know, I think that it's important to face reality. And the United States at the end of World War II had the strongest economy of all of the other countries in the world combined. We were in a position to not only shape the post-war world, post world, but to underwrite it. And we did with the Marshall Plan and then the program, similar programs in Asia. We helped the, the economies and the political development and the security of all of our new allies, including some who had been our adversaries during World War II. We were in a position that we could do that. 
when we did it, it was never intended to be permanent. It was only intended to be a helping hand to countries until they got on their feet. When President Trump took office, for example, the Germans who were not paying their fair share in NATO, they had an, a, a surplus in their budget. They were giving refunds to their taxpayers. Meanwhile, we were a trillion dollars a year underwater and had a structural deficit of really a trillion dollars going forward. Who are we borrowing that from? Americans, but Japanese, but Chinese. And the Chinese have been able to use that leverage of basically being our banker, basically having the mortgage to really exploit their position. So when President Trump took office, it, you know, it would have been really easy for him to say, well, peace and harmony, we're gonna do the same thing we've done for 75 years, but he didn't. He went to those countries and he said, you know, you've got to start helping too. You can't always take advantage of the United States. Now, when he went to those countries and said, let's have fair trade, let's have no tariffs, instead of these unequal tariffs where Germany has a 25% tariff on American cars, uh, and we have a 2% tariff on German cars, President Trump said to the Germans, why don't you drop the tariffs? They said, of course not. Well, of course they didn't want to drop the tariffs. They like things just the way they were. So what did Trump do? He started tariff force. If you've got a 25% tariff, we've got a 25% tariff. Now let's both go down together. In that approach, whether it was with Germany or the European countries, the Japanese or the Chinese, has resulted in new trade agreements, which I think were actually were significant. Um, that there are new trade agreement with Canada, Mexico, Japan, South Korea. There'll be one with the Brits. I think there'll be follow on ones with the Europeans after that. And so again, deeds or words, you know, the words sound great, but if you don't have leverage, if you don't have economic power, and the United States is never going to be in the position that it was in the immediate post-war period. The Chinese plan to be in that position. So again, deeds, not words. Thank you, KT. Tony, American leadership going forward? Well, I think the deeds when it comes to Trump's uh, tariff wars, President Trump's tariff wars, uh, have fallen squarely on the shoulders of Americans, not on other countries. Uh, our consumers have paid for those tariff wars, and so have our manufacturers, so have our farmers. But the, the, the bigger picture is this. Look, whether we like it or not, the world doesn't organize itself. Um, until the Trump administration, through Republican and Democratic administrations, the United States played a lead role in doing that organizing. We helped to write the rules, shape the norms, animate the institutions that govern relations among nations. President Trump has abdicated that responsibility, putting America in full retreat. When we're not engaged, when we don't lead, then basically one of two things happens. Either some other country tries to take our place, but probably not in a way that advances our interests and values, increasingly, that's China, or no one does, and then you tend to get chaos. Either way, that's bad for America. Uh, with Joe Biden as president, he will reassert American leadership, leading with our diplomacy. We'll actually show up again, day in and day out, in these institutions that President Trump has abandoned. We'll work on the agreements that he's torn up. We'll engage the world, not as it was, because KT is right, the world has changed, but as it is, and as we anticipate, it will become, with rising powers and new actors, super empowered by technology and information, who we have to bring along if we're actually going to make progress. We'll act with humility. After all, most of the world's problems are not about us, even as they affect us. We can't just flip a switch and solve them. But we'll also act with confidence, with the knowledge that America at its best has a greater ability than any other country on earth to mobilize others for the collective good. On the minds of American Jewish voters this year will be the future of the US relationship with Israel. America's alliance with Israel based on shared values, the deep convictions of majorities in both countries, and strategic necessity and dependability, has long enjoyed overwhelming bipartisan support. Nevertheless, there have been strains in that support in recent years and efforts to highlight those strains for partisan advantage. KT, President Trump's strong identification with Israel has been a defining feature of his presidency. In a second term, how would you expect him to use his record and his political capital to further reinforce the relationship and enhance Israel's security? And Tony, how would a President Biden, with his own strong record on Israel, maintain the trajectory of the U.S.-Israel alliance, even as some in your party question it, and advance Arab-Israeli peace? KT? Um, a couple of things. One, I would point out that although uh, Vice President Biden, President Obama, and presidents prior to that had always talked about moving the capital of Israel to Jerusalem. None of them ever did. 
President Trump did it. People told him, oh, you're going to have war in the Middle East. This is the end of the world. He did it. And look what happened. Everything is fine. The second thing, though, is the Iran nuclear deal, which I think impinges on Israel's security um, and has from the very beginning. Iran is the major threat to uh, peace in the Middle East. It was not only Iran's nuclear program, but Iran's foreign policy. It's, it's um, support of terrorist movements and particularly its animosity towards Israel. So not only did President Trump uh, pull out of the Iran nuclear deal for, I think, very good reasons. One, while it did stop temporarily Iran's nuclear program, it did nothing to stop Iran's missile program. And it did absolutely nothing. In fact, it rewarded Iran, financially rewarded Iran, um, that it could use those monies then to support its terrorist programs. You know, before the Iran nuclear deal, Iranian economy was in so much trouble that they had started defunding some of their um, terrorist support uh, for Hezbollah and others around the region. When the Obama nuclear deal came through, then what did it do? It gave, it gave Iran a lifeline to continue, I think it's malign activities through the region. So what President Trump has done was continue to press Iran, not only pull out of the agreement, but to sanction Iran. Iran is now in a desperate position. It can't afford to do the, the um, activities that it had been doing in the Middle East because of American energy independence, which thank you very much, President Trump, and which I believe Vice President Biden has talked about, in fact, pulling back on the American fracking revolution. That has made us independent of Iranian and Middle East oil. And then number three, and perhaps most importantly, I think Donald Trump has managed to do what no leader has done for thousands of years, which is to get the Israelis together with the Sunni Arabs, the Gulf Arabs. Um, we've switched, the Obama administration switched from support for the Sunnis to the Shiites in Iran, President Trump brought it back to where it belongs. And I think you now have the best prospects for peace in the region because of Israel's relationship with the Sunni Arabs. Thank you, Katie. Actually, um, touching on Iran and touching on Israel's relations with some of its neighbors is also going to come up further in, 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 at later on in our debate. Tony, let me, uh, let me, let me come back to you. What, how would a, would a President Biden approach the U.S.-Israel relationship and Israel's security uh, in, 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 if he were to be the president? So, you know, Joe Biden made his first foreign trip uh, as a young senator to Israel in 1973. He met with a prime minister by the name of Golda Meir, who had a young aide uh, by her side by the name of Yitzhak Rabin. He's worked with every Israeli prime minister since then. And he's demonstrated in word and in deed an unshakable commitment to Israel's security, including when he was vice president through the Iron Dome Missile Defense Program and the largest military aid package in U.S. history. Um, he's got a lifetime record to show that he understands that Israel is America's closest partner in the Middle East, the world's only Jewish state, and one of the best partners we have from everything from counterterrorism to now counter COVID, given Israel's remarkable record in dealing with the coronavirus and the science and technology it's putting to work for the benefit uh, of the world. On our best days, uh, we both aspire to shared values that Joe Biden actually cares about. You can count on him to make sure Israel has what it needs to defend itself, to honor the bipartisan traditions of U.S. support for Israel, to safeguard, not put at risk, Israel's future as a Jewish and democratic state, and never, never to try to turn support for Israel into one more wedge issue that divides Americans. Israel is so much stronger when Americans are united and when America is respected around the world. Uh, Tana, let me let me drill down on one part of the question that uh, that, that I posed initially, which has to do with uh, what's going on within the Democratic Party on uh, on, on Israel. How would uh, would a Joe Biden presidency uh, deal with the divisions within the Democratic Party? Well, I think you've already seen some of that. Some of these issues came up in in, in our primaries. Uh, Joe Biden has spoken out strongly and stood strongly uh, against the BDS movement, uh, which he uh, has criticized in no uncertain terms. Um, he's also been very clear uh, that he would not tie military assistance to Israel to things like annexation or other decisions by uh, the Israeli government with which we might uh, disagree. At the same time, uh, he stood strongly for the proposition that the best way, and indeed the only way, to fully guarantee Israel's future in security as a Jewish and democratic state, and to give the Palestinians a state, is through a two-state solution. And so any unilateral actions by either side that make that already difficult prospect even more challenging is something he would oppose. Unfortunately, we've seen under the Trump administration 
uh, a full-scale sprint away from any prospect of being able to realize a two-state solution, which is profoundly in the interest of Israel and its future as a Jewish and democratic state. Thank you, Tony. KT, do you wish to respond? Um, look, there's, when President Trump, one of the first things he did was make clear to, the, to Bibi Netanyahu that he will give Israel whatever it needs to defend itself by itself. Moving the embassy to Jerusalem was a significant marker in the strength um, that President Trump really holds the relationship between the United States and Israel. The second great marker was to work with the Sunni Arab states, with the Saudis and others, to have them withdraw their support for radical terrorist movements, which was, an, it was at the time people had said, well, we'll never get the Saudis or the Qataris to stop supporting the radical movements, but he did. And you now have cooperation between the Sunni Arab states and Israel against what they see as a common enemy, which was Iran, Iran's expansionist program, Iran's terrorist program, Iran's nuclear program. So I think that, that President Trump, by his, his actions in the three and a half years he's been president, have shown that Israel has no stronger friend. And again, I would say the deeds, not just words. The words are important, yes, but the deeds are far more important when you're talking about real security and real results, especially for a country like Israel, which understands that negotiating without leverage, that isn't negotiating at all. That's just sort of hoping for the best, and frankly, it's begging. And it hasn't worked out very well for Israel in the past, but now it is working out well for Israel, and that's because of Donald Trump's support. Thank you, KT. Tony, uh, talk about the um, relationship that Israel, that is the, the beginning of the warming of relations between Israel and uh, Sunni Gulf states especially, um, but also the relationships that have um, really deepened uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean generally uh, between Israel and, and Cyprus, Israel and Greece, Israel and Egypt and Jordan on natural gas. Um, some of this was, uh, was, was very much on the agenda of the Obama administration as well developed uh, further in the Trump administration. Talk about those kinds of new relationships that Israel is creating in the region and also in the Arab world. And what would a President Biden do to help advance that? Well, these kinds of relationships are important uh, and something that we should work uh, to help and, uh, and strengthen. Uh, and indeed, that's something that Vice President Biden has had deep uh, experience with, uh, including uh, working uh, with Israel and Sunni Arab states Turkey, when uh, relations were at a particular low, uh, et cetera. But uh, I think we need to come back to something that, that the KT was talking about, because it really does go to the heart of our security and to the heart of uh, Israel's security, and that is Iran. Um, on its own terms, President Trump's policy is an abject failure. He said that, and th these are deeds, not words. He said that tearing up the deal would compel Iran to negotiate a better one. He said that maximum pressure would cause Iran to stop nefarious activities. And exactly the opposite has happened. Those are the deeds we've seen. Iran has restarted dangerous parts of its nuclear program that the Iran nuclear deal stopped. It is now closer to a nuclear bomb than it was when President Obama and Vice President Biden left office. And President Trump has no strategy and no plan to stop it. He's even begging Iran to come back to the table before the election. And as to Iran's dangerous actions, President Trump has swung wildly between doing absolutely nothing, for example, after the missile attacks on Saudi's oil infrastructure, which fed Tehran's sense of impunity, and veering between that and reckless escalations that got Americans killed, made the Gulf more dangerous, and put us on the brink of starting a new war. President Trump announced he would withdraw our small number of forces in Syria by tweet, no coordination with Israel, no taking its interests into account, no, no taking the interests of our allies who had forces next to ours into account. Then he abandoned the Syrian Democratic Forces, the very folks who had taken the fight to ISIS and helped retake the caliphate that they had built. He handed American positions to Russia and to Assad, who were carving up what's left of the country. In Iraq, he had to abandon military positions where ISIS looks to try to revive. The U.S. is seen as profoundly unreliable and Iranian provocations increased, not decreased, in Syria, and of course recently, cyber attacks versus Israel. So, to deal with the nuclear problem, uh, problem that is now more acute uh, than it was, uh, if Iran returns to the deal, we should too, and then work with our allies and partners to strengthen it and lengthen it. And to deal with Iran's provocations, real leverage comes from having the world with us, not against us. 
Respect for U.S. leadership is at a historic low among key allies. The Europeans in particular have spent most of their energy trying to keep the JCPOA alive and working around U.S. foreign policy, not with it. Reestablishing our credibility, reestablishing our leadership is the best way to engage Iran with a united front and the best way to actually deal with their provocations. Thank you, Tony. So, KT, um, you raised the issue of Iran on a couple of occasions. Um, let's let's go back to that and how President Trump is has been dealing with uh, with allies and how it's how he's been confronting Iran uh, since pulling uh, the United States out of the J JCPOA in May of 2018. Is America and the region safer um, because of America's pullout and in light of the disunity between America and our allies and the unraveling of the JCPOA? How do we get back to uh, some kind of a negotiated agreement or some other way to remove the nuclear threat and the aggression that Iran uh, is conducting, uh, imposing on its neighborhood? Well, I think President Trump took a pretty bold decision, which is I remember at the time, uh, Vice President Biden was extremely critical of, which was to take out um, Salam, uh, Soleimani, Qasam, Qasam Soleimani. Um, President Trump did it. It was a calculated risk. He had communicated with the Iranians. Don't you dare respond in any way that will escalate this situation. And I think you saw the Iranians back down, much to the surprise of a lot of the critics in his own party and, and certainly in the part of Vice President Biden. By taking out Soleimani, it not only took out the, the sort of titular leader and the heroic mastermind of Iran's foreign policy program, which was to dominate the region and to destroy Israel. But it turned a lot of those people um, upon, back on each other. They really haven't recovered. Um, they may make threats, they may talk about it, but there really have been no major um, attacks by the Iranian proxy groups on Israel ever since. In addition to that, the Iranian economy is in trouble. The sanctions that the United States has put on Iran, I mean, Iran has one product that it sells to the world, right? Oil. And because of the sanctions that President Obama has put on Iran after pulling out of the Iranian nuclear deal, Iran is in desperate shape. Now, have they come to the negotiating table yet? No. But are they going to? Or are they going to eventually have to? Iran is in such a dire strait, and now the pandemic has made them even more desperate, that I think that, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. And I do think that the Iranian situation, the Iranian mullahs are so afraid of their own people rising up against them, that frankly, President Trump will negotiate with these leaders, if they want to, or the people who take their place. And how does that affect Israel? Well, I don't see how a strong Iran helps Israel. And I certainly think that a weakened Iran, weakened internationally, weakened economically, weakened domestically, and weakened with its terrorist proxy armies, has helped Israel more than any other act um, that any president has done in recent times. Thank you, KT. Uh, Tony, you, you said before that um, Vice President Biden uh, would like to see the United States back in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, back in the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, would you expect this to be an unconditional return to JCPOA? And um, and, and talk about the possibility of him continuing or suspending the additional sanctions that have been levied on Iran under President Trump. So first, it's important to point out that no one, of course, is shedding a tear over the demise of Qasem Soleimani. But let's look at what happened. Um, Iran then conducted direct missile attacks on our bases, not even via proxies. And many Americans were injured uh, with traumatic brain injuries that President Trump dismissed as headaches. Uh, we came this close to getting into an escalatory cycle with Iran that we couldn't control and that could well have led uh, to another war. Uh, Iran's proxies became more active. We had to pull back from bases in Iraq that were being used to make sure we could counter any resurgence uh, of ISIS. Uh, and uh, we saw a spiral uh, that put our uh, security at risk, that threatened even further the security of Americans in the region uh, for no gain. Uh, the only fact, the only reason that we've recently seen uh, a calming is because of American pullback, uh, not deterring uh, Iran. Um, I'm glad we avoided a war. Um, second, uh, you know, going, uh, going forward with the deal, um, Iran would have to come back into full compliance. And unless and until it did, obviously, uh, all sanctions would remain in place. And then if we come back into compliance, we would use that as a platform with our partners and allies who would be on the same side with us again to uh, negotiate a longer and stronger deal. 
uh, President Trump's actions have had the unfortunate result, among others, of isolating the United States, not Iran. Uh, we need to flip that. Um, unless, unless either of you is insistent Fine. on jumping in with a rebuttal, I'd like to move on to another question. KT, you're good? I'm good with that, yeah. Um, let me let me let me broaden the lens a little bit to other parts of the world and other relationships the United States has. Um, President Trump has sought to establish personal relationships with traditional U.S. adversaries, um, the periodically praising the authoritarian leaders of Russia, of China, of North Korea, in defiance of conventional foreign policy thinking and practice. KT, what's the strategic thinking behind these efforts, and have they paid off? And Tony. Would a President Biden adopt a different approach? Well, I think President Trump, um, by just by the way he conducts foreign policy, you know, as I said before, he's not a politician. He's not a foreign, he doesn't know the niceties of the dance of diplomacy. He's a businessman. And what does a businessman do? They look at their bottom line every night. They, did they make money? Did they lose money? He was in the television business. He created a whole new you know, a whole new field of reality television. What did people in, in the media, they look at their bottom line. Did they get ratings that day? Did they not? President Trump will one minute flatter a leader, the next minute he'll trash it. You know, with, with Kim Jong-un, one minute he's they're sending each other love letters, and then the next minute they're trash talking each other over the size of their missiles. These are means to an end. These are not meant to be positions that are, are dug in the sand. There are ways that President Trump uses to negotiate the same way he did in the business world, where you throw things out. Maybe something works, maybe something else works. Maybe this one doesn't work. But what he has done is shaken up the complacency of American foreign policy that I think has been going in a very bad direction for at least 15 years. We have been so inordinately focused on Afghanistan and Iraq and rebuilding democracy and toppling dictators in the Middle East. And, and both President Bush and President Obama we're doing the same thing differently, but it was the same goal. Top of the dictator, democracy emerges. Well, we've now seen that that doesn't happen. And at this, and while they were doing that, they were losing attention and diverting their attention from the single most important thing in foreign policy that matters is Asia, is China, is, is the future of the world. It's not going to be in Europe. The future of the world, trade, politics, um, military presence is going to be in Asia. So I, I think that President Trump is doing this deliberately. He's trying to, to disrupt because what was there before was not good. It wasn't serving America's interests. It may have 20 years ago, but it no longer did. And it was a realization of the harsh reality that you could no longer continue to do what you were doing and expect something better to happen because it was we were slowly but surely falling under the strain of the deficits that we were building up and the expansion of China, the malign um, activities in the Middle East of Iran, and frankly, Russia's resurgence. There is nobody who's been tougher on Iran than President Trump, on Russia than President Trump, on Asia, on Africa, on, on China particularly than President Trump. And I think it reflects a new reality and the situation as it is, not as we would like it to be, but as it is. Thank you, KT. Tony, I think you're, you're ready. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I actually agree with KT on the importance and centrality of Asia, which is exactly why President Obama and Vice President Biden undertook the pivot to Asia, rededicating, reallocating our resources, our time and energy to Asia, building up our alliances with Japan and Korea uh, and other countries, uh, try, uh, putting 60 percent uh, of our Navy uh, in the Asia Pacific, reanimating the institutions uh, that give smaller countries uh, a strong voice in order to help uh, them stand up to China and of course, uh, pursuing the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, uh, the trade agreement. Um, but you know, whether it's China, whether it's Russia, whether it's North Korea, whether it's Iran, we are always stronger and more effective when we're actually working with our allies and partners, not alienating them as this president has done. And it's just common sense. Um, take our trade differences with China. Alone, we're about 25% of the world's GDP. But together with our democratic partners, who are similarly agreed by China's commercial practices, we're 50 or 60 percent, a lot harder for Beijing to ignore. What does President Trump do? He rejects coordination with our allies on China and starts many trade wars with them instead. And what about results? What about the benefits uh, of um, the policies he's pursued? Have President Trump's policies yielded benefits? Absolutely, for our adversaries. Uh, consider North Korea. Uh, under President Trump, an already bad problem has gotten much worse. 
The president veered erratically from threats to love letters. The three summits that he granted to Kim Jong-un proved to be the art of the steel for the North Korean despot. Kim got the international legitimacy he craved, a suspension of our military exercise, a lessening of economic pressure, and we got nothing. In fact, worse than nothing. North Korea has continued to advance its illicit nuclear and ballistic missile programs while defying UN sanctions. Joe Biden would actually work with our allies and partners to deal with these challenges, and he won't be writing any love letters to Kim Jong-un, and certainly not to Vladimir Putin. I think it'll be news to Putin that President Trump has been tough uh, on Russia. Uh, I think we all know uh, it's just the opposite. Uh, KT, I'm gonna let you respond. Look, the sanctions that President Trump has imposed on Russia have been crippling. And as far as, you know, I never can understand what people mean working with their allies. Well, give me some fact. I mean, does that mean you just sit down and have talks with them and, and chat with them? Or does it mean you actually have some muscle behind those talks? You know, we have new trade agreements with Japan, with Korea, with Canada, with Mexico. We will have one with Britain. We will probably follow on one with the United Kingdom. From those, President Trump has already made it clear, as has Boris Johnson, that we will start building from those to build a coalition of democracies and, and, and countries which will live by the same principles of free trade and respect for property rights as the United States does. The, the pivot that President Trump has made in the last month on relations with China to incorporate the like-minded allies in, in the world that we could trade with. This decoupling is one of the words that's been thrown around. And, and those are, those are, this is not just sitting around and having negotiations with our friends, because negotiating with your friends is not nearly as important as having leverage with your friends together and going after your adversaries. President Trump is the first president that stood up to China. He's also the first leader in the free world that has stood up to China. Other countries have now seen how China's behaved itself in this pandemic, when they've threatened to withhold medicines, when they've threatened to withhold testing equipment, when they've threatened Australia with the collapse of its agricultural community, if it possibly says anything negative to China. China's done the same thing with the Philippines, with Japan, with, with Korea. There are a number of countries which are now sufficiently aggrieved by China's behavior, especially in the last three months, that they have indeed um, are willing to and are indeed coming to with the United States to then present a united front. So it's not just talking about it, it's actions that have been taken. A lot of this is spurred on by reaction to the, to the Chinese who have now, the, the curtain has come, has been pulled back. People now see what the Chinese have intended to do and what they're intending to do now. So I think it's a new opportunity for every president uh, whoever is the next president, and I sincerely hope it's Donald Trump, because he's the only one who's shown by his own actions that he is willing to take those tough steps. Unpopular that sometimes they are, but effective as they have been. KT, thank you. Tony, I think the question to you is, is Vice President Biden tough enough for the job? <laughs> well, let me give you one example. Again, we're I'll give you a few examples. Uh, we're, talking, we're talking deeds, not words. By the way, uh, the curtain has been raised, and it has been raised on an extraordinary pivot by President Trump on China, maybe more of a pirouette. Uh, again, when the virus emerged, praising for weeks on end their transparency and cooperation instead of insisting that they be forthcoming with the information the world needed and let our experts and other international experts into Wuhan. Um, and then suddenly, four months later, when his management of the pandemic has been catastrophic, uh, looking for someone to point the finger to. He should have called out China and held it to its responsibilities on day one, uh, not uh, a day, many days, many months uh, uh, late. Uh, and uh, as to toughness, and let's talk about deeds, uh, not words when it comes to China. When China uh, unilaterally declared an air defense identification zone that would require planes to identify themselves coming into airspace that was international, Joe Biden went to China, he met with Xi Jinping, and he said, we're not paying any attention to your air defense identification zone. Uh, we're gonna ignore it and we're gonna fly our planes through it. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, when China was engaged in massive uh, cyber theft of our commercial secrets, Joe Biden is the one, along with others in the Obama administration, that negotiated and, and a tough deal with China, made it very clear to Chinese leadership the sanctions they, their companies and individuals would face if they didn't comply. We got an agreement that our intelligence community said the Chinese were adhering to, unfortunately it atrophied under President Trump. And when it comes to North Korea, 
Uh, Joe Biden is the guy who went to China and said to the Chinese, if you don't join us in getting tough on North Korea uh, with sanctions, getting them to the table to negotiate uh, away their nuclear program, uh, then uh, we're going to have to take steps that aren't directed at you, but you're not going to like. More U.S. forces in the region, more exercises, more missile defense. And as a result, we got the two toughest U.N. Security Council resolutions in history uh, on North Korea and sanctions that were beginning to bite and to bring North Korea back to the table. Those are deeds, not words. Tony, thank you. I'd like to turn to a, another question entirely, uh, which has to do with the alarming increase in anti-Semitic incidents uh, mm. around the world and, and also in our, in our own country um, with the synagogue murders in Pittsburgh and, and Poway, um, multiple attacks on Jewish individuals and institutions uh, across Europe in recent years. How would your candidate, each of you, how would your candidate combat the resurgence of anti-Semitism? and protect vulnerable Jewish communities here and around the world. I think I'll change it up and, and start with you, Tony. Thank you. Well, look, we have to start by meeting what is resurgent anti-Semitism here at home, and we have to do it head on. Uh, there are lots of practical steps that we can and should take, and I'll give you just one practical example. The major program that Joe Biden announced to better protect synagogues and other places of worship and to, move and to more effectively prosecute uh, hate crimes. He has an entire program on combating uh, the resurgence of anti-Semitism and hate crimes here at home, grounded in practical steps. But you know, this is really about leadership. And that leadership starts with the President of the United States. President Trump's demonization of immigrants, his wild conspiracy theorizing, his celebration of cruelty, his own use of anti-Semitic tropes, his encouragement for the far right, like those folks who marched in Charlottesville chanting, Jews will not replace us. All of that has helped make this country and the world more dangerous to the Jewish people. You know, in fact, President Trump's response to Charlottesville is actually what got Joe Biden into the race in the first place. Um, in the fight against anti-Semitism and racism, there are not very fine people on both sides, as President Trump proclaimed. There is one right side. You'll never have to wonder if Joe Biden is on the right side. He stood up to BDS on the left and to the far right because he knows that anti-Semitism isn't about where you sit on the political spectrum. It's about right and wrong. He will do what's right. KT, your response, please. I mean, I guess I would ask Tony um, about really, has President, Vice President Biden been willing to stand up to the people in his own party who have Referred, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. You know, question that the same way that you've made accusations of President Trump this and the world thinks that. You don't have to, KT, you don't have to take my word for it. The record um, is clear. Well, I would disagree. And I think that one of the things that has been so upsetting is in the national political debate, something that we assume both political parties would respect the rights of Jews abroad and at home and were against anti Semitism and, and would not tolerate it for a minute. In, in the Democrat Party, there seems to be a movement by the progressives, the far left, whatever you want to call them, the squad, um, to reconsider the relationship, not only with Israel, but to condemn Jews in the United States. And, and perhaps President, Vice President Biden has said something, but I must have missed it because I've not seen him speak up to that wing of his party. In fact, if anything, Vice President Biden has looked at that wing of the party, of his party, and has embraced it. And so I, I do think that if you're going to look at leadership issues, it's not only, it's, it's the absence of leadership. It's the absence of the courage to stand up to something because it's politically unpopular with your own base. And so I would fault President, Vice President Biden with that. And I would applaud President Trump for the courage to call those people out for what they are, which is anti-Semites who would seek to divide not only the Democratic Party, but the country. Tony, I think I should let you respond. Thank you. Well, I, 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 maybe I shouldn't, uh, I can't say I blame KT necessarily for having, for example, not watched the Democratic debates. <laughs> there, that may be a, been a reasonable choice to make. Uh, but the record is very clear that Joe Biden has spoken out forcefully and consistently against uh, BDS. He made very clear, uh, for example, when some in our party were advocating tying our military assistance to Israel to decisions by the Israeli government uh, on things we didn't like, for example, annexation, that he would not do that, never do that, and thought it was a crazy idea. Um, but 
at the end of the day, maybe the most powerful and, uh, and, and important moment in our recent history up until this moment, when it comes to bigotry, racism, and anti-Semitism was Charlottesville. And what President Trump did in responding to Charlottesville, frankly, is disqualifying. Very fine people on both sides. It's almost unimaginable. These were people, the, the very fine people he was talking about on one side came out of the woods chanting the worst anti-Semitic bile, the kinds of slogans we heard in the early days of Nazi Germany in the 1930s. And what did President Trump do? He said there were very fine people on both sides. I'm sorry, that's the end of the story. It's disqualifying. One final question before we go to uh, closing statements. Um, there have been increasing challenges in recent years to the continued role of the United States in international bodies, particularly UN agencies such as the UN Human Rights Commission with its chronic anti-Israel bias. Uh, KT, how can America play a leadership role in international affairs if it steps away from these established institutions as President Trump has done or threatened to do? Has leaving the Human Rights Commission and UNESCO uh, over anti-Israel bias achieved the administration's reform objectives? And Tony, is America treated fairly and does it get a suitable return on investment in UN institutions? And would a, would a President Biden approach uh, these agencies differently? Would he unconditionally rejoin the Human Rights Commission and press Congress for the authority to rejoin UNESCO, for instance? KT? Um, again, as I think has been a theme and, and part of this conversation, is that President Trump is not interested in being parts of, of international organizations that are not fulfilling their purpose. Look at the World Health Organization. What is their job? Their job was supposed to be to warn the world of pandemics and, and mounting crises that could happen and affect the global economy and the global population. What did they do? They did just the opposite. They sat on information. They were China's cat's paw. They, they refused and denied any, um, any possible human human transmission until it was far too late to control the pandemic. So that's one example. But the other thing I would say with regards specifically to Israel, when President Trump um, had just been elected, so the period between the election and the inauguration, there was over Christmas of 2016, there was a debate um, at the United Nations about Israeli settlements. And the Obama administration, for the first time in, gee, my memory, and I've been around at this for 50 years, the Obama administration refused to support Israel. Now, President Trump did support Israel. So did a lot of, of Republican senators and a lot of Democrats, including Senator Schumer of New York. And that, to me, was a real wake-up call that what, where is the Democratic Party? Have, where is it going now? I mean, if President Obama is not going to have Israel's back, then what happens to Israel going forward? Because if America doesn't have Israel's back, nobody has Israel's back. And so with regard to what is our international position on these things, Let's get something for our investment. And if we're not getting something for our investment, let's renegotiate so we do. And if we don't, if countries are working at our disadvantage or working against us, whether it's a UN commission or other international organizations, why should we continue to support something that is harmful to the United States' best interests going forward? Thank you, KT. Tony? Look, to me, it's the difference between leading and leaving. Um, we do need to be fully engaged in international institutions, even ones that are not living up uh, to uh, their responsibilities and potential, including the UN, not despite the unfair treatment of the world's only Jewish state, but because we need to be there to counter it directly and forcefully. Walking away, ceding the field to other nations doesn't solve the problem. It simply means America is not at the table to defend our values and to defend our allies. Um, so if you want a candidate who walks away and withdraws America from the world, in a fit of, of peak, by tweet. Uh, yeah, you're right, Joe Biden's not your guy. Um, if you want someone who will actually show up with the leverage that comes when America is actually engaged and respected in the world again, to demand that Israel is treated fairly, that's what President Biden will do. Um, at every critical juncture, we stood up for Israel's security. I'll just relay one uh, anecdote very quickly. Uh, in the midst of the very hot summer that featured the conflict in, uh, in Gaza. I got a call late one night when I was in the job that the KT also held, and we both had the toughest job in government, Deputy National Security Advisor. 
I got a call late one night from the Israeli ambassador, Ron Dermer, and he said, can I come over tonight? Uh, it's something urgent. And I said, of course, come on over. This is about nine o'clock at night at the White House. And he and the military attache from the embassy laid out to me in detail why Israel urgently needed a replenishment of Iron Dome interceptors that were saving lives from missile attacks. The next day, I went to the Oval Office. I sat with President Obama and Vice President Biden. I laid out what I'd heard from the ambassador and the military attache, and I got three words from both of them in response. Get it done. That was Friday morning. Tuesday, we had a quarter of a billion dollars from Congress to replenish Israel's Iron Dome supply. That's the kind of real action, real deeds, that go to the heart of Israel's security and that Joe Biden is committed to. I think at this point, we'll go to closing statements. Um, thank you, Tony. Uh, we'll have uh, one minute for each of you uh, to, to, to sum up, and, and then I'll close out this, uh, this conversation, uh, which has been um, vigorous and informative, and I want to thank you both uh, going into the, uh, into the final round here. So, KT, let me ask you to begin. Closing statement. If I could begin just by thanking you and thanking Tony. You know, all too often in the United States today, any political conversation, any debate is just a shouting match. And we're all better than that. And so I really applaud you, you all, for the position that you've taken for keeping this civil, Tony, keeping it to the facts as you see them, as I see them, but arguing on the substance of it and not name calling. And Jason, I really want to thank you and the AJC for once again offering an intelligent, substantive debate that doesn't debate personalities or character, but really debates the issues. So let me get that out of the way. And then just close with a, a, a short story. You know, in the, in the worst days of the Civil War, when the, when the North was losing battle after battle, when general after general took command of the Union forces and just was being outsmarted, outmaneuvered, by the Southern generals at every single point where it looked like even the North with its superior economic power was not potentially was gonna lose. What did Abraham Lincoln do? He looked around at all of his generals and he said, tell me about that guy Grant. And all the people in the United States politics, the establishment said, you can't, he's terrible. He's a drunk. He doesn't shave. He doesn't tuck his shirt in. He doesn't, he's just terrible. He just, nobody likes him. And so how could you even be thinking of somebody like Grant? And then Lincoln said, well, you know, Grant wins wars. He wins battles. And then the opponent said, well, no, no, that, I mean, really, come on. You can't think of U.S. Grant. He's, he'll be a disaster. So what did Lincoln say? Find out what that guy drinks and make sure a bottle of that is sent to every one of my generals. Now, at the end of the day, General Grant did win the Civil War. And, a, and it was a brutal war that affected the great divisiveness of the country and then managed to help bring us back together at the end. I know Donald Trump says stuff that makes people mad. I'm sure the allies snicker behind his back, but guess what, he gets it done. Whether it's moving the capital to Israel, whether it's standing up to Iran, whether it's standing up to China, whether it's fixing the American economy, whether it's rebuilding the American military, whether it's telling our European allies, pay up. So. I think the next four years are gonna determine the next century. We either stand up to China, get our allies together with us, and then make sure that democracy and free market capitalism thrives and certainly survives. And if we have the wrong president, it's over. The American century will be something of the past. And once China becomes the world dominant power and rewrites the rules to its own purposes, then America may never rise again in the same way. So that's why I would say, if you want to go with the past, Joe Biden's your guy. If you want a guy who's mean, tough, and like U.S. Grant and wins wars, go with Donald Trump. KT, thank you. Uh, final comment, uh, and you'll have a little more time, Tony. Thank uh, you. Thanks very much. And I want to echo uh, KT in, in, in praising uh, the AJC uh, for bringing us together. And, and KT, thank you as well uh, for engaging in this debate and in this, uh, in this civil conversation, even where we disagree. And that's the American way. We can we can disagree uh, over each other's uh, judgments, uh, but uh, hopefully keep it uh, civil and focused. Um, you know, 55 years ago, Martin Luther King addressed the AJC. I, I, I looked it up, and he said, among other things, it's a very powerful speech. Uh, America, he said, must not become a nation of onlookers. America must not remain silent. Not merely Black America, but all of America. It must speak up and act. 
from the president down to the humblest among us. Well, I think this is a time for all of us to speak up and act, especially at the ballot box in November. This election is about more, much more, than a choice between different policies. It is about the character of our president and the soul of our nation. Every American child learns about uh, our first president, George Washington. Famously, he could not tell a lie. Our current president seemingly cannot tell the truth about anything. And he has used the vast power of his office to divide us, to pit American against American. What does it profit a person to win the world but lose his soul? No policy is worth it. We always say before every election, this is the most important election of our lifetime. This one really is. The choice has never been clearer. The stakes have never been greater. America cannot afford, the world cannot afford, another four years of President Donald J. Trump. Joe Biden will summon the better angels of our nature. By his character, his decency, he will bring us together to heal at home, to lead in the world, to move America forward. Thanks so much for listening. That concludes uh, this AJC Virtual Global Forum Election 2020 debate. Um, I want to echo what, uh, what, what you, KT, and you, Tony, said about this spirited and yet civil debate, which we like to think is a model for HAC behavior on, uh, on contentious issues, and it has been one of our calling cards. Um, you have always worked with us and spoken to us, and we appreciate that very much in the past and right now and, and, and going forward through this complicated year. Uh, I want to thank the audience for taking part in this uh, global forum debate and, and look forward to staying in touch with our audience and with you personally, Tony, and you personally, KT, on the issues that we've been discussing today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both.